Movies about movies. Today, number six. A movie about a movie about a vampire. No, the vampire. <laughs> Vampires are more popular than ever in books, movies, and television, but these days, of course, they're sparkly and sexy and teenage -y. But the first movie vampire, they went a different way. A rat-tooth, bat-eared creepazoid. F.W. Mornow's Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror, 1922. If you have ever enjoyed a horror movie, anyone, from Bride of Chucky to the T-Chronicles to Super Brainy Zombies, you owe F.W. Mornow. The first vampire movie, the first horror movie, and still, in many ways, the most unsettling vampire movie of them all. Is it still scary in the 21st century? Eh, maybe not scary, no, but still very haunting, very creepy. Never lose sight of the fact this guy Mornow was making it up. He didn't have a model. Tarantino watches other people's movies and he goes, oh, that's how you do that. Oh, that's how you do that. Yeah. George Lucas copied endless movies shot for shot when he did Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. But more now, with his production designer, Alban Grau, and his cinematographer, F.A. Wagner, they made it up. Grau was producer, costume designer, production designer. Wagner was one of the most talented cinematographers working in Germany in the 20s and 30s. Every shot in Nosferatu is designed and composed with exquisite care and intelligence. At least a dozen of them will imprint indelibly on your memory. Nosferatu is really an easy film to get obsessed with. Stephen Katz started his obsession at age 10 or 11. The performance of Max Schreck as the vampire, Count Orlock, the teeth, the ears, the gliding moves, the stillness, the fingernails. At some point, Katz thought to himself, wait, this guy doesn't seem human. What, what if he actually is a vampire? What if it turns out Mornow wasn't making a horror movie, but filming a sick documentary? Katz fleshed out that premise into a darkly comical screenplay, a fantasy film about the making of Nosferatu, Nosferatu BTS, behind the scenes. His agent sent the script to Nicolas Cage, who had just started his own production company, and boom, green light for Shadow of the Vampire. Cage recruited the director E. Elias Marriage, and the writer Stephen Katz had a specific actor in mind when he wrote the script to play the part of Max Schreck as an actual vampire. He wrote it for Willem Dafoe. Happily, Cage and Marriage concurred, and Dafoe was available. I think it was Cage who first thought to pair Defoe with John Malkovich as director Friedrich Wilhelm Mornau. Both these lead actors are founding members of two renowned theater companies in the U.S. Defoe, the Worcester Group in New York City, Malkovich, Steffenwolf in Chicago. These are actors, actors, intelligent, fearless, funny. I think it's worth watching Shadow of the Vampire just to see these two masters of their craft. Have at it. There are a few scenery-chewing and bombastic explosions, maybe over the top. But with Malkovich, there always are. I think that's why you hire him, isn't it? There's also delicate subtleties in both their performances. I mean, think about what Defoe is doing here. He is playing a vampire who is pretending to be an actor playing a vampire. It sounds like sketch material, not in Defoe's hands. He is very funny, but at the same time, he carries the weight of centuries of unspeakable sadness and isolation and horror, loneliness. He becomes as vain and difficult as any movie star, and on top of that, he's starving, literally. It's a richly layered performance. I mean, to put a comedic gloss on Max Schreck without losing the horror, it's extraordinary work. Defoe got an Oscar nomination for it. The whole cast is strong. I especially love Eddie Izzard. He plays Gustav von Wagenheim, the actor who plays Hutter in Nosferatu. That's the real estate agent who journeys to Transylvania to meet the mysterious Count Orlock and negotiate the sale of a house in the city. If you have seen Nosferatu, you know that Hutter is a strangely passive, simple, childlike slightly effeminate guy who never quite gets what's going on. He's always a beat behind. For example, he wakes up after spending the night in Orlok's castle. And he finds two marks on his throat and he goes, oh, mosquitoes. Now, to be fair, he's never seen a vampire movie, but the terrified superstitious villagers at the inn gave him the handbook. He had the briefing. Mosquitoes. Hunter blithely sells Orlock the big house right across the street from his own house to the peril of his wife and all their neighbors. Fat commission, of course. Salesman. Izzard's performance stands on its own, but if you have seen the original, he is hilariously on point. The plot of Nosferatu hinges on that disastrous bargain that Hutter struck with the vampire, and the plot of Shadow of the Vampire hinges on a similar short-sighted bargain, one that Mornow makes with the vampire. But what could a movie director possibly offer as payment to a vampire? Hmm. Lunch. 
and that sets up the core conflict between the fictional Mornow and his undead star, the vampire getting hungrier by the minute, Mornow struggling to keep him from feeding on the cast and crew, at least till he gets the last shot in the can. All the while trying to persuade the cast and crew, this Shrek guy, just a method actor, Stanislavski, he just doesn't want to break character. You can relax. Director Elias Marriage also wants to make some serious philosophical points about art and immortality about the movie camera itself being a kind of vampire that sucks the life from living actors, leaves them as undead shadows. If you're into symbolism, it's not bad. Maybe it's just me. I don't really have a lot of patience for the philosophical speeches. But I have to admit there's something to it. I mean, watch Nosferatu. Nobody in that film is alive anymore. Yet their undead performances still captivate us. The movie camera does turn living actors into undead shadows. Happily, the key players of Shadow of the Vampire are still with us, still doing amazing work. Defoe is having a fine 2014. The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Fault in Our Stars. Shadow of the Vampire is a wonderful, enjoyable film, but it is not, like Nosferatu, an immortal one. I think it's too cluttered. For one thing, in Nosferatu, the vampire has only about 10 minutes of screen time. He's in our head the rest of the time. But in Shadow of the Vampire, once the vampire shows up, he hogs the screen like Hamlet or Richard III, and his lines aren't nearly as good. The mysterious primal evil of the original is diluted by treating Orlok as a demanding diva, bargaining with his director for more close-ups. It's a good premise, but I think it wears thin. I think maybe to compensate, marriage just piles on comedy, horror, philosophy, social commentary, the decadence of the Weimar Republic between the wars, drug addiction. He puts a lot of freight onto the film, and in the process he proves that more is not necessarily more. But when it's good, Shadow of the Vampire is delicious. Until next time, I'm Mikola. DVD Extras. Opening shot of Shadow of the Vampire is an extreme close-up of the eye of the director, followed by a matching shot of the lens of his camera. The camera is Mornau's own camera, the actual camera that Mornau shot with, borrowed from a private collector. One of the liberties that Shadow takes with actual history is the way it treats the producer. Shadow of the Vampire reduces Alban Grau to the cliché of a harried producer, struggling to keep up with and clean up after a mad visionary director. But in reality, Grau was an essential part of the creative team. The film was his idea to begin with. He was into supernaturalism. He was not only the producer, but the designer of the sets and costumes. He did the concept art, the storyboards. Not only that, he designed the promotional posters. Cautionary tale for YouTubers. Nosferatu is based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. So why is the vampire called Orlok and not Dracula? Why is the young couple called Hutter and Ellen instead of Jonathan Harker and Mina? Well, it turns out Mornow didn't clear the copyright with Bram Stoker's widow. Part of that reflects the fact that movies a hundred years ago were seen as kind of a bastard child of the arts. Not respectable, you know, like, like YouTube now. Movies were an upstart, not like the theater. What? License my husband's novel to a movie? Oh, no. We're going to make a proper play of it, put it on the West End, and send it to Broadway. No rights, no problem. Orno and Grau thought they could get away with filming Dracula without rights. Just change the character names. No one will know. The widow Stoker was not fooled, not amused. She sued, she won, and a court ordered all prints of Nosferatu be destroyed. That is the ultimate takedown notice. So please, clear your copyrights. Luckily, a few prints escaped destruction, but for most of my life, Nosferatu was viewable only in terrible multi-generation prints, jittery, flickery, scratched, faded, mottled. There's even one of those on YouTube, but please don't watch it. Because amazingly, in 2006, a restoration was issued based on a few nearly pristine prints that were discovered in film archives around the world. Missing shots were found, some existing shots were extended, original tinting restored, a reconstruction of the original symphonic score was recorded. That's the one you should watch. Here is a trailer for the restored Nosferatu. It's on Netflix or on Blu-ray. And here, the trailer for The Shadow of the Vampire. Now, here's a dry but very deeply researched documentary on the real story of the making of Nosferatu. And if you missed Super Brainy Zombies or the Tea Chronicles, you can look for them here. No, I'm not plugging any of my own videos today. You know where to find me, don't you? Well, you found me here. Bye now.